Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Today we are talking about the health of the planet that starts with the soil. And we have soil ecologist, worm expert, Rob Blakemore today with us. Thank you so much for joining, Rob. Happy to be here, Joy. Thank you. And uh, hello to all the listeners, viewers. Yeah, thanks so much. This is the first time we've talked to anybody about... Oh, that's all right. Your, your doggy. What's your dog's name? It's Tris. He's got a sister, Isla. And I think their mum is just coming home, so they're going to go crazy about food and walks and things. So oh, sorry okay. about that. No, it's fine. It's fine. You've got your microphone on, so everything's good. Um, I think you're you're the first guest that we've talked specifically about soil and soil ecology and worms. We have had organic farmers on the series. We have had a no-till farmer. And I know your research is mostly about worms and soil health. Um, but I think there will be a lot of connections with previous guests. So wonderful that you can join us. Thank you so much. I, I did research on organic farms starting in 1980, which is a long, long time. It was about 40 years. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, supportive of organic farmers and the hard work they do. And organic farmers I can talk to because they absolutely love worms. <laughs> so, yeah, they're allies. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so, of course, composting is a big part of uh, soil health and worm activity. Um, before we dive in, dive in deep to worm culture, um, can you tell us a little bit how you started your, your passion for soil health and worms, studying worms? Um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it might be a nice story because I went to university in London to study ecology and we did it all ecology, aquatic, um, uh, terrestrial, we did behavior, we did you know, um, genetics, we did uh, chemistry, biochemistry, all aspects of ecology. And then we had to do an honors project. And I, uh, I come from Shropshire and it was Darwin's birthplace. He actually, he visited the village that I grew up in to collect his samples. And it was the uh, centenary of his Darwin's earthworm book in, um, in, in 1981. So I thought I'll do a project on earthworms and I was interested in organic farming. So I went to Lady Eve Balfour's Hawley Farm, which is the pioneering experiment she set up in the 1930s. And it had been going for 40 years when I did a survey. And no one had really done a survey of the earthworms there. And it was incredible. Um, adjacent fields had completely different soils, completely different earthworm populations. And I couldn't believe it. I was uh, walking through the field in the, the agrochem uh, agrochemical sections and my boots were sticking in the mud, it's very hard to dig. The next field over, organic field, it's like chocolate cake. The soil would just melt in your hands and smelt beautiful and loads more earthworms. So I was pretty much convinced that, that, that there was something to the earthworms, the organic farming. And I looked at all the, you know, the chemical aspects of the soil and also the yield, which is quite an important thing for the farmers. So we had all these benefits from organic farming. And um, I don't know why people persist with chemical farming because it's just, a, um, you know, it doesn't make any economic or ecological sense. It's very destructive. So that's how I got started in earthworms and um, organic farming. I've been promoting it since, but there's very little support. There's almost no support for organic research. There's no support for earthworm research. I don't know why that is. So pretty much um, a lonely voice looking for allies. Since you mentioned about organic farming, I think this is a, a common, maybe misunderstanding um, from the consumer perspective. A lot of people question, why should I pay more for organic vegetables or organic clothing or organic cotton or organic juice? Like what, why pay more? What is for the user? What is the benefit for the environment? Um, look, I, I'm not, I'm not positive. Chemical produce is subsidized. Um, I think in Japan, the, the farm chemicals are 50% subsidized from government taxes. So you're paying already for, for the, the foods you get that taste terrible, destroys the environment, destroys the soil, makes you sick. Then you need pharmaceuticals, which you get a 70% discount in Japan from you know, the, 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 the insurance, which you pay for in tax. The chemicals you put in the field makes you sick <laughs> and you need the chemicals. And it's the same companies. It's often the same companies making the poisons and making the cures for the illness they cause. I, I don't, I don't be too political, but Bayer started this in the 19, uh, 100 years ago. They made poison gas, and they also sold gas masks. <laughs> so 
You want to die from poison gas? Buy our gas mask. And it's the same mentality. Oh, you got cancer from, from the food. Well, we have uh, ontological drugs to, to treat you. It's very cynical. Very, so it, it's normally more expensive, but you'll save the health costs. You'll, you'll be saving the environment. It tastes better. And they say it, it doesn't have any difference. They call it uh, equivalency in the, the chemical and organic. But your taste is a very fine machine to detect you know, um, characteristics of food. And if you taste organic food, I mean, you'll be convinced. And you'll feel healthier. So even at the moment, it is more expensive. You should lobby for the subsidies to be removed from chemical farming or for the chemical companies to pay for the damage they do environmentally. And then they'll, they'll soon collapse. Actually, Bayer has just been fined $10 billion. That's $10 billion in the US for causing cancer with one chemical, one type of cancer in one country. I think their days are numbered. So soon, common sense will prevail, truth will prevail, and we'll all be converting, reconverting, reestablishing uh, technological, modern, organic farming. So that's what I look forward to. Oh, so it I is hope, more expensive. I hope but so. It's, it's good, has but, many benefits. but that's such a good point, And that goes for the meat industry as well. The meat industry is subsidized by our taxes. So the yes. actual cost of meat, of course, environmental cost is much, much more. But the actual cost of meat is never what people pay because of the tax subsidies. So if we put subsidies into organic farming, we could all eat better, healthier, and have a lot less damage on the environment. So really, it's, you're, you're right. It's a very political problem. Main problem, Joy, and this is right, people may may come to this conclusion themselves. The main problem is the worms do all the work for free, <laughs> so you can't make profit from worms. You can't sell worms. You can't poke them to make them work harder. They do all this work, but your company can't make profit. You sell the chemicals, and the, they don't work. So next year, the farmers, or well, you need more chemicals. And I, I have a, a graph. I don't know if you'll show it of the chemical use since the 1960s, the Green Revolution. They're using like eight times more fertilizer to get lower yields. <laughs> it literally doesn't make sense. And they're using, despite uh, Silent Spring and EPA, this 1960s, they're using tens of times more poisonous chemicals for no return in crop. It doesn't make any sense. It literally doesn't make any sense. And I think, um, I forget who the, the, the person said, when you spray a chemical to kill, a, kill an insect in a field, it's like bombing New York to stop criminals. <laughs> You're destroying everything. It's like a, a, a scorched earth, and then you're left with just a, 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 a infertile, sterile medium, which is the soil, to grow your chemical crop on. So it's, it's you're, you're going towards hydroponics. Um, yeah. So that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I've also heard that it's creating the chemical uh, fertilizers and the pesticides is also creating desert. Desertification, so taking all the moisture out of the soil, and you have to water so much more if you use pesticides, and the earth and the soil become so damaged. You actually need so much more water, and of course, water is definitely a very important issue going forward, even the next five years. Um, even in Japan, the last three weeks, we haven't had much rain. Suddenly, I noticed all around the trees are so dry and brittle. I mean, climate change is changing the environment all over the world. Some places like Japan who usually get so much rain, we might suddenly be drought ridden, right? So thinking of water and the value of water in farming is really important for Japan, I think. Look, um, organic farming is carbon farming. Carbon is, is locked up in uh, soil organic matter Part of that is humus. Humus attracts moisture. That um, uh, chocolate cake, sponge cake I mentioned, that soaks up water and it doesn't get waterlogged. So it still has uh, aeration. It's, um, it's uh, fluffy um, and it stores water. Uh, organic soil on farms stores about 25% more soil moisture. That's equivalent to an extra you know, rainfall. That'll take you through a drought. That'll take you through the harvest or early seeding. This will... Uh, organic farms are carried through extreme climate conditions. So when you when you destroy the carbon in the soil, you you lose the moisture, and that leads to desertifi desertification. 
that is one of the biggest issues now. The soils are turning into desert. They're being poisoned and we're losing topsoil. So it's a very big issue. Also, we've been kidnapped. Over 150 years ago, um, von Liebig came with this idea that plants only need chemicals, NPK. But the two things that plants really need is water and carbon dioxide. Those are the main ingredients. So H2O, H2O and CO2, the water is the key one and carbon dioxide is the next one. All the other things are just a, you know, minor. So the main ones aren't NPK, they're uh, carbon dioxide and water. So yeah, water is very key. And also, I should say this, when I've done the comparison from the Borlaug, the uh, you know, Green Revolution, the greatest correlation with the higher yields they obtained in the Green Revolution was with irrigation. They increased irrigation at the same time they increased fertilizers and used different um, varieties. So chemicals, they really don't have a leg to stand on. But no one ever, you can't ever, I can't ever publish these papers. These go to the journals. The journals are funded by the chemical companies. They go to the uh, reviewers who work for the chemical companies. You can't pu publish any papers on organic farming. So it's all about water. You're exactly right. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. And uh, I, I think I saw one of your articles and you said uh, in six days of working with worms and soil, you were able to fix the CO2 excess. Have I understood that correctly? Um, look, I, I, I've been looking at the figures. Another thing I, I'm quite shocked about, scientists are lazy. They get money and we're all busy. Okay, I, I should be polite. I should be, I should be in, try and be more moderate. So. We're normal people, scientists are normal people, but scientists can't lie. You, ha you can't ever lie. Any scientist who lies is not a scientist. Okay, so they make mistakes, we all make mistakes. What happens is we, we build on other people's papers and it's very common, instead of doing the original research, you quote other people and you assume they've done the research. So I do taxonomy as well. Taxonomy, I, have to, I look at a worm, I have to read every paper about every worm ever written to find out whether this is known. It's a horrible industry, uh, taxonomy. Um, it's time consuming, it's pedantic, it's petty. You have to go right back to the original text written in Latin, which are all online now, which is a good point. But the point of this is now I go back and I look at the original sources for all these papers and all these claims, and I get shocked and I get disappointed. And uh, it's they make these wild claims and it's unsubstantiated. Some guy back in the 1950s made a guess, and they're all quoting that. And then I look at the data they're publishing, and it's not substantiated. So in answer to your question, in Japan, in a day, all the carbon that's supposed to be produced in one year is recycled by the plants in summer. If you look at the data up in, um, I'm, going to get it, I'm going, to, going to get it wrong, it was up in Nikko somewhere. I've forgotten the name of the town. They, they did a, a survey, measured all the uh, inputs and outputs of respiration and fixation by the plants, and in one day it goes down. And, uh, I've, and also this works at continental scale. In the Northern Hemisphere, now we're, we're in all shut down for winter. Come into spring, all the green comes out, all the carbon gets sucked out of the atmosphere. About 80 gigatons of carbon gets sucked out of, the CO2 gets sucked out of the atmosphere in just six months in the, nor in the boreal region, the Northern Hemisphere, well, the, the, the far north. So the, the, the turnover of carbon in the atmosphere is the whole carbon gets recycled in about four years. Now that's NASA and IPCC say that, but they include 90 gigatons, they say, is from the ocean. Now that's unsubstantiated. That one I talked about, it's a guy called Seuss, Dr. Seuss, not that Dr. Seuss, another Dr. Seuss, in 1958, 1957, published a paper saying he speculated it might be 80 or 90 gigatons comes from the ocean. It's a, a passive. Um, Henry Law uh, exchange of molecules. There's no data for that. In 1958, the year after Seuss's paper, um, Keeling started Mo Mona Loa, the monitoring the atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide, and they've measured it ever since. There's no substantiation for any of these claims about this uh, ocean uh, contribution. It's all from the land. So, yeah, um, the excess can be easily recycled in one, one week in Japan, and in one year, I mean, there's huge productivity in the north, and we're missing it. All these, all these papers are missing it, and it's just right there. Um, talk to me about Japanese earthworms. It looks like you've done a lot of research and you know a lot about Japan's earthworms. 
happy to talk about earthworms anytime. Yeah, um, when I came, we had an inventory of about 100 species, and I've, I've probably added a few. I've taken a few out. They're called synonyms. Uh, people give names to something that's already named. That's, that's one of those things. You go back to original references, write back hundreds of years, and then you come forward and say, we've got to change the name or it's already named. Um, what can I tell you? We have a mix. We have about four. I've, I've, I've toned it down. There's about 40. I know about 60 natives and 40 exotics in Japan, so about 100 species. But we know nothing. Every field trip, I find new species. And I have a new species here, if you're interested. I don't think you see that. <laughs> this is um, yeah, Dendrobina. I found this in my compost last, last month, and it's a new record for Japan. It's a European worm, but I think it's come via U United States. So it's in the compost in Japan. And for the last month, I've been talking to the worm. I have all these, these are, these are baits, baits from the, you know, the fishing stores. So the, there's about 20 or 30 worms in these boxes. So I've been checking all the stocks. And this worm is all through Japan. It's been distributed. And I checked my records. I think I found it in nine, uh, 2002. I, I just didn't recognize what it was. But now I've confirmed it's, uh, it's a new species. So this is uh, uh, Dendrobina venita. So <laughs> new record for Japan. So. That's how much, how little we know about earthworms in general. So, yeah, I'm keen to study earthworms. And I think I sent you a picture of one worm I got from Okinawa uh, a couple of years ago. And that's another story. It glows in the dark. Yes, fantastic, isn't it? Um, that's, a, that's a new species. I took, we do DNA now. We take a little sample of tissue and we send it off to a lab. We run it through a PCR sequencer and we get the, the a barcode. We use a mitochondrial gene. Okay, and then you can compare it to a library, which is on GenBank. All these uh, DNA records go to the central library in, in the United States called GenBank. And you do a, a check of your specimen from all the other known specimens, and you get an answer. It might be right, might be wrong, but you get an answer. So I haven't had the funds to do that, but um, I'm happy to send those samples off at some stage. And uh, yeah, but the point about Okinawa is I went into the forest, and I found many, many worms, probably several new ones. I went into the cane field and there's no worms and it's right next to the, the forest and I couldn't find any worms. And then when I went to the port, I saw the shipments coming in of, um, was it 40, whatever, 40, 80, 40, the NPK. So they're using NPK. That's an exact example of the, this is an island. It was actually from Kumejima. I don't know if you know Kumejima. It's one small island, met much sugar cane, many other crops, but it's tropical. They grow a lot of sugar cane. And they're poisoning, they're destroying the soil. So they'll have to use more and more chemicals. And I did uh, um, research in Philippines on organic sugar cane, fantastic earthworms, and the yields are much, much higher. So there's no penalties from having organic sugar cane, only benefit. But the chemical companies won't make any money. <laughs> yeah, well, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. Talk to me about how worms are beneficial um, for the soil. Can you give us a general rundown? You sent me some great pictures comparing soil with three layers with no worms, yes. and then all the great layers that gets mixed because of the worms, right? I'll show that now. Okay, um, do um, this is one of the things that the earthworms, they, they have so many benefits. I mean, they're real movers and shakers in the soil. Um, if you put any, if you have sterile soil, and this is how all agri agronomic uh, experiments are done, I did it myself. I did my PhD and f three years research. All of it was wrong. I learned what not to do. You start, you sterilize the soil because if you have a worm, one worm in one pot, you'll get huge yields and it, it'll it'll skew your results. So you destroy the soil, then you put in the bits of components you want to check, you know, the chemicals and so on. I was using worms, but anyway. Um, so the, the earthworms in the, the soil, if you add any other component, it'll just sit there. But if you add earthworms, every other component, every other component of the soil fauna comes into play, all the microbes. So they're changing the physics, the chemistry of the soil, and the microbial activity. They stimulate. They have these little highways. They, they rip through the soil. So I'm going to, I might get the figures out, but um, one uh, square meter of soil can have nine meters of earthworm burrows. I mean, that's incredible. A hundred, one, hundred, one square meter has 100 little holes going down. Well, it can be 15 meters sometimes. So one, one hectare of soil 
uh, earthworm pasture has nine kilometers of earthworm burrows. Isn't that incredible? I mean, this is aer aeration channels. It's all fluffed up. I mean, the roots can go down there. The, it's, it's also in perfect synchrony with the plant needs. So it's seasonal, the plant needs, and all the activities in the root zones where the plant needs it. So no, chem no chemist can ever do that. I'm not being nice to chemists, by the way. I, I'm, I'm rude to them, um, but they never fail to react. That's meant to be a joke. <laughs> Sometimes I get no reaction, but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just not very keen on chemists because they're not qualified to comment on ecology. And I think agriculture is ecology. They're not qualified to talk about it. In fact, they're not qualified to talk about ecology or earthworms. So they can't. <laughs> but I can talk about chemistry because I studied chemistry and it's a tiny little part of ecology. A, a, a bit boring part, but it's not essential. Um, it, we're all about life. This earth is about life. And um, we actually, the chemists, I'm going to say it, they, they cause problems and they don't fix their own problems and they cause more problems. So they, tra they have solutions to problems they've caused. You know, it's like having the dung beetles in Australia. Um, oh, we're going to we're going to bring in the dung beetles. We have a problem with dung, and I'm going. Well, just don't eat meat. You know, if you don't have cows, cows you'll solve the dung. Now, give me the millions of dollars a dung beetle project. It's ridiculous. I mean, really. So um, there's another thing too. We talk about this, the worms in the soil, and you know, it's like that movie, Build It and They Will Come. If you make uh, fertile soil, lots of cover crops and lots of mulch, the worms will come. You'll be really, really surprised. But we also have compost worms, which tend to be different species, like this guy here, uh, Dendrobina venita. We have many compost worms. They make the compost, and they really do improve the compost. If you leave it microbial decomposition, it can be a little bit slow and doesn't have all the uh, um, benefits of uh, earthworms. So there's some microbes. We, only have, we don't have all this information, but there's some microbes in the earthworm gut that have, uh, produce um, plant hormones, plant growth ho hormones. I'm going to get it wrong. It's auxins and gibberellins. I think it's those two. But um, isn't that remarkable? So the worms are making plant growth hormones to make the plants grow more. So it actually is their benefit. They get more food for the, the worms themselves. It's called coevolution. The plants, the microbes, and the earthworms, and the soil, they're all a continuum. That's amazing. I, I was <laughs> listening uh, before coronavirus. I was doing these Seeking Sustainability events. And we had some organic farmers come from the U.S. and they were talking about uh, communication in the soil between plants and trees. Oh, yeah. And and I thought that was so exciting and so wonderful. And I totally believe it. And then your argument about, you know, with worms and how it, it integrates the soil and the worms and the plants help each other. Of course, nature is so brilliant. Why are we trying to think that we know more than nature and trying to push our weight with chemicals because we think we know better? It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Take it all back. You go back to von Liebig. It's the 18, 1840s, I think. They started to do this, 1840s. said, oh, plants only need chemicals. And actually, that, that was just sat there. But what happened was they had the First World War, which was pretty devastating. And the, the Germans wouldn't have, would, were blockaded. They would not be able to make munitions if it wasn't for this guy called Fritz Haber. So Fritz Haber had this system of cracking nitrogen out of the uh, uh, atmosphere, and this nitrogen made munitions. Now, this nit all the nitrates are also, well, they're not good fertilizers, but they act as fertilizers. They're salts. They make the plants thirsty, so the, the plants take up a lot more uh, moisture, and they, they have a higher yield. So the surplus after the First World War was all these you know, munitions, nitrates, and they managed to convince us that these were, were, could be uh, good for soil. They're not. We, we're, better off, we're better off composting, recycling. The nitrates are a whole other issue. You'll see the, uh, I give you Rockstrom, the planetary boundaries. Nit nitrate pollution is one of the most extreme events, uh, uh, conditions we all face. It's causing soil acidification. It's causing all kinds of pollution in the waterways. It's destroying the soils. It's destroying soil life. It's a major, major problem, and we need to wean ourselves off. The alternative to that, and I never criticize something if I, if I, unless I can offer an alternative. If you criticize something, you have to have an alternative. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? So organic farming, it has higher yield or equivalent yield. It has less cost. It um, has a bit more labor. It's a bit more labor intensive. There's your unemployment problem solved. And it's also, um, it needs more people in the country. So there's rapid urbanization problem solved. You know, 
I wouldn't recommend anyone go and work on a, on a chemical farm. You'll get sick. And it's usually the poorest people, and they take their children on the fields with them, and the, the children get sick playing in the soil. But I'd, I'd recommend woofing. Go and work on an organic farm. Or better still, start in your garden, have an organic garden or ba uh, balcony, and then just start uh, advocating and uh, promoting organic food. Don't listen to the propaganda. It, what's propaganda? It's all propaganda. You can't read any papers about organic farming. I get attacked. Um, I might even be attacked from this, but you know, I get attacked. My work doesn't get published. It took me 20 years to publish my survey of Lady Eve Balfour's Hawley Farm. 20 years. Many papers rejection. I don't know why I persist. Why I'm still persisting? I don't know. No, I, I persist because I believe in it. I know it works. And I really, I hate a lie. I really hate a lie. I'm not saying all chemists are liars. I agree with you. I think it's um, we our earlier talk. I think it's ignorance as well. <laughs> so, so it's um, yeah, that's it. I hate people who lie, and scientists shouldn't lie, and they're lazy. You need to go and check the facts, check the sources, and it's unsubstantiated. And they do a comparison, one chemical with another. They don't do a comparison with compost because they know they couldn't compete. And I think I sent you the link with Rothamsted. There's 180 years of constant yearly records of soil and yield. And they've added compost to the plots every year for 106, 180 years. And the yields have been the same or higher from the compost. So they know it. And then I, I'm talking a lot, but I'll talk a bit more. Um, they did a survey in 1922, a guy called Hubert Morris, I think, he dug survey at Rothamsted. And all the chemical plots, all the worms were dead, all the insects were dead. They'd killed the soil. Um, they found one of the problems is highly acidic. So they started to add lime and they got some benefit came back. But they can never restore the earthworms compared to the organic sections. Now, Rothamsted have attacked me about my statements. I published a paper and I've got so much attack from the Rothamsted paid Rothamsted chemists. So these are agriculturalists who are chemists and they don't know anything about the soil. In fact, the soil is a horrible inconvenience for them. They'd rather just have a you know, matrix that they can just use the chemicals. So this is the world we live in. And um, you know, what can I say? It's, it's political, highly political. It's highly uh, corporate. These companies are massive. you know. And um, I think organic farmers, they need to persist and be, just be brave, be brave and be strong. And eventually, I think truth has to come out. But what I can't understand, and maybe you can help me with this, the people who are using these poisonous chemicals, their families are getting sick too. I'll tell you another story. My contemporaries I went to school with in the country, mainly farmers' sons, or they worked on farms, they're all dying. They're all dying of cancer. You know, it's, that Their environment is so toxic. I mean, it's a horrible disease to have, and they're all dying. So people my age aren't here anymore. Well, I'm, I'm getting older, so it's, you know, it's, it happens with age, but the numbers are quite shocking. I mean, I'm losing people almost every month. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, and it, it doesn't, like you said, they have families, um, they have children, that why don't they care what kind of world their children are growing up in, or their grandchildren having a chance I at don't... a healthy life? It's, it's short-term thinking. It's thinking about just profits, and it's not trying to think of, how we can choose less disastrous choices and also make a good enough profit. They're just thinking about profits, right? And that's, it's so damaging. I mean, if they were more imaginative, there, there is plenty of industry here. I mean, you've got to shift your mentality a little bit, but there is, there is, there's, we're going to have an economy. I mean, and food, food is a, a major part of you know, our, our requirements. I mean, we're going to be in a little bit of a pickle fairly soon when we've destroyed the soil. And all these ridiculous ideas of you know using vertical farms and you know, you're going to have to have a huge area you know, to produce crops. But then the others, there are lots of encouraging signs. I mean, the workforce, the farm workforce is aging, so they're all going to be gone. You know, sorry to say this, but in, you know, uh, uh, 20 years, it's going to be a completely replaced workforce. So hopefully, young people will have more of an idea about um, permaculture, organic farming. And um, I was going to say something else. I've lost, I've lost my train of thought a bit. Um, the, the, oh, the, um, about the young people, I think. No, I've lost it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come back to it. <laughs> That's okay. I have a question about no-till farming because the pictures that you've sent me, so the no-worm 
uh, layers of soil are so clean and undisturbed. And then the soil with the worms inside is all meshed together and there's loads of wonderful worms in there. Is that a good argument for no-till farming where you don't turn up the soil? Look, look um, the chemical companies are on to it. They know organic farming is the future and they're heavily investing in organic farming. They're actually paying people to do carbon farming. And they say, we're going to set monitors on your farm to measure moisture and carbon and so on. So the chemical companies are into this and they've captured um, no-till farming. Uh, you can call it conservation agriculture. You can call it, um, you know, regeneration. This is also highly political and I'm going to make more enemies than friends. But I don't, want, I don't want, you know, bad friends. I want good friends. And these people who promote this, they have to know. So regeneration farmers, they, they did a survey in the U.S. and 99, over 90 percent said they still use agrochemicals. So it's not organic. Forget regeneration farming is organic. No-till is purely political. It's chemical no-till. Oh, we use herbicide instead of utilage. Now, that's propaganda because organic farmers do no-till. In fact, um, Masanobu, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, you've got to help me. Fukuoka. Um, Masanobu Fukuoka, and, uh, one straw revolution. That was no-till. He used mulch cover, rice straw mulch cover. He didn't till the soil. It was all natural. He subplanted so that the next uh, crop came up through the other crop before it's harvested. And they used the harvested crop as a cover to stop the weeds. That was no-till farming. So there's many kinds of organic no-till farming. But Roth, um, help me, um, the, the organic farm in the U.S., it's a family one, Rodale. Rodale Farm, you know, in, in um, I think it's Massachusetts, is it Massachusetts? Yeah. Um, I visited there one time. So they use crimping. The crop, they grow a uh, cover crop and they crimp it. They just bend it over with a machine. So they don't even harvest it. They, they just uh, knock it over so it's incorporated on the surface of the soil. And then the worms do all the work. Plus you have all the roots below ground, which you don't see and are never included in the calculations. So all these wonderful things. So no-till is bad. It's chemical. And they're trying to uh, kidnap organic farming. They're trying to, it's a greenwash. They're trying to pretend to be, uh, um, accommodate the, you know, the environmental concerns. It's just more chemical um, misinformation. Now, I'm going to uh, alienate all the conservation agriculture people and all the regenerative farmer people there. And frankly, they need to you know, lift their game. So you're organic or you're not organic. And in fact, I've just signed up last week with the Real Organic Movement because the USDA in, the, uh, in America certifies organic farming and they're letting the standards slip. And I noticed the other day you had an organic farmer from Japan, an Australian lady. She was saying, well, J Japanese standards have slipped. What they allow in organic farms? Now, organic has to be organic. You know, you can't, you, c you can't be, you know, half and half. And I've done surveys on organic, half and half, and full chemical. In fact, Lady Eve Balfour's Hawley Farm was just that. It was organic, uh, it was chemical, and it was a mix of the two. And the mix of the two was an unhappy compromise. It was almost as bad as full chemical. So... You have to you have to bite the bullet and be completely 100% organic. You can't be you know organic light. And anyone who uses chemicals, they should admit they use chemicals. So um, no till for me is a is a no no um, unless it's if, unless they say organic uh, no till or reduced tillage or direct you know direct drilling. All these things are, are good farming practices that I wholly endorse. But I don't I don't agree with any chemicals on the farm. I'm afraid. Yeah. And when they say oh you're going to lose yield, no we're not. Um, I'll tell you the reason why not, and this is why I forgot before. Most farms are small holdings. They're less than two hectares. Most farms are market, you know, little market, uh, garden, garden farms. 80% 80, 80 in some countries are the farms are small holdings, and they provide most of the food for the families, most of the people. So uh, industrial agriculture is at, at least, at, at most, 20%, no, sorry, 20% or more. But it's not 100% uh, of the farming we get. And on the other hand, organic farming, official organic farming is only about 2%. It's a really min minority. So when they say organic farming, just, it's, it, they give the impression it's 50-50. It's not. It's a, it's a very small endeavor because it's not supported. It's not um, subsidized. It's not researched. And, you know, there's no support for it. So people have to do this from find out for themselves. I'm talking an awful lot here, but I'm no, happy to no. answer any questions. You you know so much. I'm happy to listen. Well, um, of I course, hope I'm not coming across as in, in the series, <laughs> in the series, we have talked with um, some no-till organic farmers, 
and yes, and they've I, talked I, about um, the value of organic, but also of not tilling. Now, I, yes. I want to talk a little bit about the SDGs. You had a graph on your blog about how the SDGs really need to talk about soil and protection of soil as as one of the SDGs. Do you do you remember that? And I no. <laughs> I'm it's, only laughing. It's, it's not okay. one of my rants. It's, it's I okay. Rants it's so okay. I but yeah. uh, but I you know everybody is is talking about the SDGs now. Now other another topic that you often talk about is the need to reduce meat consumption, and how the meat industry, factory farms, has a very devastating effect on soil. So do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Because of course that is connected to SDGs, about social equity, environmental equity, economics well, it, even, future yeah. value of products, right? I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm not too, too, too much on the economic side. I, but I'll talk about SDGs. The original SDGs, I, I did a, um, at Yokohama National University, we were doing the Millennium Goals, which was a, a precursor to the SDGs. So I was working on a project, Environmental Risk Management, and that was to do the Millennium Goals. We, we accomplished that uh, task. And then the SDGs, which pe if people don't know, the um, help me, is it um, strategic? St strategic development goals, yes, okay. And it's United Nations um, platform for 1930. I think the deadline is, the, um, sorry, 2030 is the, uh, the deadline. My problem with that is um, I checked through them when they came out, and there was, there was a, barely a mention of soil. They mentioned it twice. I quite have sent a, a, a upset and offended by that because soil is always ignored and yet it's fundamental, it's crucial, and um, because they ignore it, it gets ignored. And yet they talk about ocean. I think the ocean and the water had separate things. Now, when you realize that almost no food comes from the ocean, you say, well, what's their argument for supporting the ocean? So if I told you how much food comes from the ocean, you would be shocked and you wouldn't believe it. But it's some um, 0.3% food from the ocean. It's terrible, isn't it? It's 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 poultry, and actually it is poultry. It's about the same as poultry. All the fish catch from the ocean is about the same as poultry. And um, there's a there's a uh, aquaculture and uh, freshwater fish. It's about the same, uh, zero point three percent of human food globally. Japan's quite different because we have a lot of fish here. In fact, I eat fish. I don't eat meat, but I do eat fish. Um, um, but the protein or protein, yeah, yeah. Look, the protein from from fish. Is only about six or seven percent globally. So fish only provides six percent of protein. Of animal protein is about seventeen percent, but total protein is about six percent. And because half the fish are farmed or, or freshwater, that three percent of protein comes from ocean. And yet the oceans promote it. Oh, we need it for the fisheries. No, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. It's as simple as that. And I've shown all this data to the ocean guys, and they say, Oh yeah, but if we tell the truth, we won't get funding. And I'm going, well, you know, that's your problem. You shouldn't lie. If, if you lie and you're a scientist, well, you're not a scientist. So ch show me how much food comes from the ocean. Get them in the corner. Get them in the corner. And they'll, they'll, they'll start to try and wriggle out. They can't answer you. And they'll, then they'll start saying, yeah, but fish are cute. I'll go, OK, that's your argument. That's the only reason we study ocean, because it's cute. I mean, like, look. My unit, my my museum here. There's there's many marine. Every museum in the world is mainly marine. Not one worm guy in any museum full time. Shocking. <coughs> so SDGs because they didn't mention soil. I hate them. Um, they should they should revise it now before it's too late. They should have underlined as SDG zero. I think there's 17 SDGs. The foundation should be soil. Underlying every other SDG. Without that, none other no other SDG matters. So I'm quite passionate about that. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's the foundation. How can you how can you build a decent community without a clean soil foundation that works and creates yeah. food that you can eat? How can you have gender equality if you can't have food that's healthy, right? How can you do any of the SDG goals without good quality soil that's going to be good quality into the future, right? Every other goal is contingent upon a soil foundation. Yes. I mean, even the ocean gets most of its nutrients from the soil, from runoff, from drift, you know, and their pollution all comes from the soil. 
you know, you, you're starting me on a rant, which I, I could I could start to go on. But um, you know, all this money is put into the saving the reef and you know ocean research. I mean, uh, Jamstech, huge, huge in Japan. Jamstech. I've been to the facility. You have to have a you know bicycle to cycle around. They have huge pools. They have how many research vessels? And okay, Japan, we have more fish than most people, but still, there's not one soil ecology institute anywhere. And I find that remarkable. If there was a soil ecology institute, I'd be happy to you know, liaise or collaborate or join. Not one soil ecology institute. You know, why? There are thousands, literally thousands of marine institutes. Why? I mean, they had a 10-year census of marine life, $1 billion, to do a complete survey of the, the oceans. I think it was up from 2000 to 2010. They published results. The, the total is 230,000 species in total from the ocean. So what, you know? I did, I did that, not a not billion dollars. It cost about a dollar. I did a survey of soil. There's 310 soil animals. So, you know, where's my you know, facility? Where's, where's my billion dollars to, to do worm research? I mean, it's very dis disparate, you know? And they have no argument to support it. They have no biodiversity. They know they don't. Two, two, million, two million species are named. So they're having 230,000. That's only about 12, you know, 12 percent. But we do know that we don't know anything about soil. We know about one percent of soil animals. So as soon as you factor in soil animals, the ocean just disappears, which is why they're so wide and why they're so desperate to um, promote falsehoods in order to get funding. And I hope they don't sue me. Well, I, well you know, I didn't mention names, but they know who they are. <laughs> so we they need, have no argument about biodiversity. We need more <laughs> accountability. You know, we need more education. We need, I mean, Japanese kids are great. They love insects. They collect beetles. They get out there in nature. You know, let's incorporate worms and the love of the soil as part of education. Wouldn't that be great? Look, we'll be more positive. I'm being a bit negative here. Um, I hope we talk about it. Um, I have a, a friend who's, uh, um, I, don't, I haven't met her, but she's, uh, her web blog is called Planters Yen. I mentioned to her, right? Planters, like a, a flower planter, I E N, planters yen. And she's done a, a compost, do it yourself compost. And she's had this most beautiful little system. I'll describe it on her behalf. I actually um, developed it myself a couple of years ago in my, in my garden, and it's been used in permaculture for a long time as worm towers. But I'll describe it to you. It's so beautiful. You have a, a, a planter box. And you have a, a, inside the box another, uh, like a bin, a, a, a recycle bin. Cut the bottom off it so the, the, the bin sits in the box and you have soil in the box. You put all your vegetable scraps in and add a handful of worms you can get from the, you know, the, and any one of these fishing stores will have the compost worms. And then you put the worms in and they will compost it. And you can either leave it self-sustaining, the plants you plant around the planter box, the roots will go into the compost. And you'll have fantastic growth of vegetables or herbs or, or flowers, whatever you want to grow. It's such a beautiful thing. Now, why I like um, uh, uh, Planter Sien, um, Harusan, her, her setup, she's got beautiful little Indian decorations and she did it with a, a terracotta. It's all natural, a terracotta pot. She cut the bottom off and used a wooden lid on top and they put a little wooden handle on. It's so aesthetic and so beautiful and it's all natural. And I just, I just, I'm, uh, hope I'm promoting her because um, I, she's not commercial, she just does it for, you know, a hobby or interest, but uh, I, I think it's wonderful. So that's something very positive, and kids can be right into it. <laughs> I, I love composting, and I have a little garden, and I've learned from some farmers that I shouldn't just put my, my waste from my kitchen hilly, you know, here and there, that it actually might be stressing my plants out. So I need a more organized compost style. I'm going to try that. I like yeah. that idea of using like biodegradable materials, like a maybe a wooden bucket or terracotta, like you said, um, fill it with my compost and have plants around it. That sounds beautiful. I'm going to try it. it? <laughs> um, she, she actually used, a, um, there's a terracotta pipe they use in the fisheries. And the fish hide it, and it's about, um, you know, 10, was that 10, 12 centimeters wide in a 40 centimeter planter box? Have a look at her website. So she just simply puts that in. She doesn't have to cut the bottom off. And you just put the, all the vegetables in there, the eggshells, 
Only thing I found not to put in is um, tea bags. And I was quite shocked by that. Tea bags are plastic. They never rot. <laughs> I thought, oh, you have healthy tea. And it goes, it's in plastic. I mean, what are we doing to ourselves? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's, it's, crazy. It's, the same, it's the same for coffee cups. Like for me to realize that if you get a coffee cup from 7-Eleven or you get a coffee cup from Starbucks, it looks like it's paper, but it will never decompose. It has oh, some might... kind of plastic lining on it. Um, so yeah, it's, be... yeah, it's they much use better to take your own cup and just yeah. refill because that's basically plastic. It looks like paper, but it won't decompose. Yeah. I think they use a silicon silicon uh, lining, and uh, the same with them. Um, is it the cooking paper, baking? Is it baking paper? If they use soy oil, you can compost it. But if they use the silica silicon silicon, you can't because it's you know it's a, it's a chemical. It's like plastic. I was using. Uh, I visited the small town of on Tokushima in Shikoku Island, a small town of Kamikatsu, which is trying to be zero waste. And one of the things that they've been doing as a whole community, as a rule, since 2003, is everybody must compost. You have to compost your waste. And then two years ago, I went to San Francisco, a city of millions of people, and they have the same rule. Everybody must compost. And they actually pick up all the compost and make it into beautiful soil which they then give to Napa Valley and all the wineries around California so you're enhancing all the products of your local area how smart right so whenever I have a chance to meet garbage or waste management people in Japan sometimes I do I always say let's do composting let's do 100% composting and often the waste management people are like yes let's do it that would save us so much money in terms of picking up processing right and then you would keep all the recyclables so much cleaner because the waste the kitchen waste is not at all in the garbage area it's never it doesn't come into context always separated so there's so many wonderful effects of composting Look, I, I, I despair about, I mean, Bill Mollison, he, permaculture, I, I did permaculture des, design with him, and um, he was in fury. He said, a fury. He said, because we could, we could do so much better. <laughs> Humanity could do, we know what, what's wrong. We could do so much better. We don't bother. And he said, I, he, he doesn't know why. And no system makes sense. They bring in all the vegetables from the country and the city, and all the trucks go home empty. Why don't you take the vegetable scraps from the restaurants? Now, at the local... Um, coffee shop down here and the apartment and the little gardens they've taken up this composting system we have it an operation you know the planter box so what happens is um you recycle it all and it all starts to make sense so then you're, you're growing your own herbs and vegetables so all the stuff you you start to recycle then you say oh the farms they can use the compost what does it do it it, it okay sequesters carbon it stores moisture it's a fertilizer it, inc it uh, increases biodiversity it produces fantastic food or win. <coughs> that's, wow, that's, that's fantastic. There's so many great knock on effects of composting. I just I don't. And, and then it saves money for the municipality as well. I just well, I don't economic too, yes. I don't see mm. why not. I mean, for Kamikatsu, they had to do something because it's a very small town. They did not have a garbage collection system. And one of the big ways they could reduce their waste by 30% right away was making everybody compost. And so I came back home and I tried it. And so all of our kitchen waste goes to the garden. And immediately for our family too, decreased our waste by 30%. So instead of one bag twice a week, we have one bag once a week, which goes out, right? So, you know, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, look at it. You must have seen it. Um, they have a, a collection here, and they have bags of all this organic matter. And they, they, they sweep up all the leaves, all, all the garden, the, the lawn clippings, the garden clippings, all the vegetables from, from the, the cooking. And there's quite a lot of waste. It all gets, I think it gets incinerated. And I'm going, this, is, this is, must be a definition of lunacy. Uh, or it gets landfill, which is even worse. Um, and then they're buying fertilizer, and they have to buy more and more fertilizer. 
it, it, it doesn't make sense. So we could be doing much better. And um, okay, it's not the it's not the government's fault. It's not the company's fault. It's really our fault. We're not demanding organic food. We're not demanding compost. If we say, oh, you know, I want healthy food, tastes nice. I want organic food. Then they'll start to produce it. And and we should be able to save from. Am I getting too dark here? I don't know. <laughs> the sun is setting. But and we should be able to save money, as you said, because. Uh, we won't have the tax to subsidize chemical farming. We won't have all the environmental damage. We won't have the health damage. And, you know, we'll save money and we can go and work and live on the farms and enjoy nature. Many benefits. Wonderful. We have a, a great uh, comment from Thomas Klepper here. And Thomas runs a no-till organic farm near me in Hiroshima. And he's been on the series many times. Um, he says, I think the same thing. It's pretty wild community composting or community goats or sheep. Thomas yeah. Thomas has animals on his farm. So he has goats and sheep and chickens and he incorporates um, giving the compost to the animals and using their waste and moving them around for weed management. He has a brilliant system there. Yeah, I, I know they're doing, they're doing good things. Um, I, I, I should also mention that um, I grew up working on farms, and they were mixed farms. I was in Shropshire, and it's typically mixed farms, and that is always stock. There's always, we had we had dairy herd, we had beef herd, they had sheep, they had pigs, they had chickens. I mean, the whole lot, and and we always rotated, and they always uh, via, uh, root crops, wheat, you know, uh, grain crops. And the interesting thing is, I went to uh, study agriculture um, at, at university in Queensland, and very few agronomists are actual farmers. They don't know what they're thinking about farming. Now, I'm sticking my neck out here, some might be, but you find out that farmers in America, or beef farmer, or your corn farmer, or your soy farmer, it's just it's monoculture. And I, I don't really appreciate that as really being a, a proper farmer because you do need to integrate all the other parts of the, the, you know, the uh, habitat. You do need to um, rotate crops. And they had lay rotation. Lay means if you set land aside. It sits there for a year with nothing happening. Maybe you have stock on it, but um, you let it rest. Now, this is all sustainable because it was a farming system that lasts for hundreds, thousands of years. And all that we're doing now is experiment. This is 50 years and it's run its course. Um, I said after the First World War, they used uh, fertilizers. They also used the chemicals. Um, actually, my great grandfather was um, uh, gassed in the trenches by Bayer. Bayer made the chemicals, the gases, to kill men. So these are very efficient at killing anything. They're not, they're not uh, herb, you know, insecticides or nematicides. You know, they're biocides. They kill any life. Same with herbicides. They're disgusting. I mean, the, the, the herbicide kills microbes as well. What's microbes? Well, it's everything. You know, our gut is full of microbes. The soil is full of microbes. So the herbicide's killing the vital microbes you need to produce the crops and to keep us healthy. So all these stuff's a biocide. So that was also came into use after the First World War. They had a stockpile. What can we use it for? With the nitrates, we'll put it on the land. We'll dump it on the soil, always treating soil like dirt. And then it intensified after the Second World War. So we've had this since, well, it was 80 years now, um, this intense agriculture. And it's all failed. It's literally failing. The yields are going down. The soil's being destroyed. We're destroying the waterways. We're destroying the atmosphere. People are, are so unhealthy. And... Um, you know, there's, there's going to be a reckoning soon. It's going to have to come to terms with we have to change the way we grow food. And it's our fault. We should know better. We should insist it's organic food. Yeah. That's wow. my take. That's, yeah. It's it's <laughs> heavy, but it's so true. And we need, we need more accountability and we need more understanding of the process. Um, I would love to see on my packaging which chemicals were used on on which products that I buy, you know, same as the ingredients because it's as important as the ingredients. Um, you've got a great quote on your blog from Bill Mollison. Yes. We must turn all of our efforts to repairing the natural world and train our young people to help. Yes. How I mean, do we do that? Inspired. <laughs> How wonderful. do we do that? <laughs> um, well, we get them interested in nature. I mean, they do love nature. And the idea about permaculture, I, I, I promote permaculture. It can be any level, but uh, you, we do a, a two-week course typically. Permaculture aims to teach the teachers. 
So that's um, that's a, a you know a spreading system. So it, you teach a teacher, it teaches ten other people, and so it goes and so it goes on. So fairly rapidly, we could have permaculture spread around the the world where it's needed. I mean, if you make your own food, you, you're not subordinate to um, a lot of the climate conditions or political conditions. And ultimately, I mean, one good thing about shutdown is non-essentials. We've come to realize non-essentials. And also people have started to garden more and they've started to you know, make their own food, cook their own food. So there are going to be some benefits out this, but it's also a, a time to reflect on what is essential and what's non-essential. And all this waste, um, you know, how good is it? What what really important? So I think you'll find out the food, water, air are all pretty important. And I think you'll find out that uh, agriculture is key to all of these. I mean, it's so fundamental. And yet, at the same time, it's the easiest thing to fix. You know, it takes one minute. And that's the you decide what you put in your mouth. It's as simple as that. Wonderful. Well, we have four more minutes. Um, is there is there any you mentioned and it surprised me you said if you start composting the worms will come if you start no, if you, putting yeah. kitchen waste out there it it you will find that worms come to your garden or do some people do buy worms right no I, I, I was saying in the field if you if you put compost on the field and mulch the field and make sure it's got adequate moisture and shade and all these things the worms will colonize naturally. It's like if you stop farming, the trees will naturally recolonize. It, it's called succession in ecology. It will revert to uh, its, its uh, optimum condition. So with compost, I have no problem with buying compost worms. And uh, mostly they're Icenia fetida. This one is um, Dendrobina venita, our friend, new record for Japan. Um, there are uh, other ones uh, in, in Japan. They have um, Perionyx excavatus, a, a blue Indian worm. And the ones I used in the tropics, I did in the Philippines and in Australia, um, was Eudrilus eugenii, which every species is so unique. And why I get caught up in taxonomy is because ecology, you need to know what material you're dealing with. And the key, the species name is key to understanding all the ecology and all the requirements and all the benefits, all, all the problems with, a, with a, a particular taxon. So Eudrilus eugenii is absolutely wonderful. In Philippines, they're a real good example for composting. Because their organic farming is built into their constitution. They have to have a percentage of organic farming. They're very keen on recycling. And the interesting thing about the kids, the school teachers are teaching the kids how to compost. And the kids are teaching the parents who are farmers. But the, as farmers, they've never been told how to grow organically. They've been told how to grow chemically. So the kids are teaching the farmers how to grow. And they're getting high yields. And the kids are getting healthier food. So I, I, I find it very inspiring how... Um, these simple things like introduce composting to school, which actually is how I started here. The local school is doing composting. So, I mean, the, it, it could, could be on a curriculum for all my school. And then also teach permaculture, which gives you an insight into systems, design of systems, agricultural living systems, how you conduct yourself, has the legal structures, has the technology structures, community structures. So I'm very... Uh, um, positive about uh, hope with permaculture and I hope it spreads more and this if you uh, things like you do I, I really admire that you're going out and you're spreading these messages sometimes you might have conflict or we might have to disagree about things that's fine but as long as we're heading in the right direction and that's restoring nature and there's no sustainability with chemicals I'm sorry that's just more chemicals it's a dependency it's horrible addictions Sustainability, we get nature coming through in cycles. I think, and I think we've given chemicals enough time to show that it doesn't work, and we don't want that. And let's go back to natural ways, please. Uh, Molly... well, go back, but, but <laughs> forward as well, because um, the, the old systems on fa farms, the tide cod, I mean, farm work has always been difficult, and yeah. uh, the old systems were not that, that good for the farm workers. So we go forward to technology and social improvements and you know, your housing improvements and legal structures. So it's a positive uh, development of modern organic farming, real organic farming. So I'm very supportive of that. I love it. Uh, I love Molly, it. Molly B says, I have great admiration for worms. My veggie garden would be nothing without them. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. And John Speary, who was in the series before, who also is fan fantastic with worms. Thank you, John. He says, do you recommend putting partially composted matter into your garden? Sure, why not? Yeah. 
the microbes, the worms will all break down naturally. Um, if you bury it, if you bury it, you might lose some of the benefits of the you know, uh, oxidation. The the surface layer is where um, organic matter usually settles. But all gardeners and farmers you talk about worms. I mean, proper farmers, they really do appreciate the worms. And so I'm happy to talk to any of your you know uh, viewers or any people who are interested in worms. I want to set up this worm thing in Japan, get everyone composting, get people interested in worms, organic farming. So uh, there is a permaculture network. I know some of the guys, um, you know. We've all been sh shut down for a while, um, but I hope it does grow. And um, with your help, I hope we, we can make progress on this. Thank you, Joy. Wonderful. Joyce. Thank you so much. Um, if people want to reach out to you, where is the best way for them to find you and your work through your blog, is it? Um, uh, blog, uh, my G I'm Gmail. It's rob.blakemore, rob.blakemore, gmail.com. Okay. So the blog I, I do sometimes, I have a blog, Vermicology. Um, verm ecology. Verm means worm in Latin. Ecology means ecology. And uh, together, it's, it's kind of solved most of the problems. So yeah, I have a blog and uh, yeah, anytime people contact me, happy to talk worms. So, yeah. Wonderful. I will, I will put the link below for sure. Uh, John Speary can say, uh, one last question from John. Uh, he says, how can I increase my worm population? Worms like food and they, they, they like things... Um, you know, not um, you can't have bare soil. So keep the soil covered with vegetation, and they like food, which is organic matter. And they like moisture, but not too much. Uh, and also give them a choice. If they they'll decide which is the optimum for them. So don't put cover things completely. One of the farming techniques is to put the fertilizer or the compost down one side of the furrow, leave the other side bare. So all the microbes and worms can choose their ideal conditions. So that those are farming techniques that make sense and. Um, you know, we could all adopt these on your garden and then experiment, you know, have a control, have different treatments, find out what works best. And look, look at the worms. I mean, if I go to an organic farm, it's incredible. I have to tell you one story. I went to an organic farm one time. The guy had a bamboo pole as high as him, two meters. He said, watch this. And he just sunk it all the way into the soil. And I'm going, that soil is so, you know, lithe and so, so uh, porous. It was wonderful. And I went to dig in a rice field next to him. I couldn't even get my spade into the ground. It was so hard. So this is what this is what organic farming does. It, it aerates the soil. He was using okara, which is a cutoff from tofu, as his, his uh, fertilizer. So I know that worms like okara, and they like uh, um, the wash from uh, from from rice. I think uh, your friend said that, right? So um, anything organic, worm, anything that's living, worms can can treat and uh, compost. I don't like to put meat in compost because it, it tra tracks rats and flies. But I don't eat meat, so that's not a problem here. But if you eat meat, um, probably not put it in compost. I've seen some great collaborations between carpenters giving the sawdust to farmers, and then uh, sake brewers might give the leftover rice material or something back to the farmers. Um, there's great collaboration between industries going on. I love to see that. Um, I have, we have farms here, the, Jap the, the cattle farms. I, you never see the cows, but they're in sheds. But they have piles of manure, which just sit there. And I'm going, this is a valuable fertilizer. You know, why aren't you putting it back in the fields where they grow the cow food, so you have a feed for the cows? So, yeah, we need to recycle all that stuff, all the organic matter. Start, start it, Joy. You, you have the charisma and the, and the, the drive. <laughs> Get Japan composting. That's a, you get know, I tried. I tried, and I, I won't give up. I will keep trying. Um, but we usually do monthly cleanups, and uh, we clean up plastic from the river. And I tell people, bring your compost, and I'll take it to Thomas at his farm. And nobody brings anything. People are embarrassed of kitchen waste, right? We have to get over that idea and think of it like a resource. This is a valuable resource. Let's put it back in the oil, in the soil. Indeed, and also you'll realize that you, when you recycle, you're not going to put plastic and, and poisons into the stuff you might be eating later. So it's very educational. And the other thing, the the, the far, farms, you can put fish waste on it. I've done that one time. Really, really stinks. And we had complaints from the neighbors kilometers away. It really, really stinks. But the the grass, the pasture, really takes off. So all those all the fish remains. They go into the fields but a long way from habitation because it's pretty horrible. And we had lots of flies. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, our time is up, but thank you so thank much, you. Robert. So many great ideas and so nice much passion you. for the soil. We need more people like you. So please keep up the good work. We'll do it for the worms, okay? Let's do it for the worms. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody, for joining today. And tomorrow, 11 a.m., we're talking with Angela Ortiz and her family who started a nonprofit in the Tohoku area to support the local people after the 2011 disaster. So we're going to be talking about what work they've been doing for the last 10 years. So please join us 11 a.m. tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.